you called down the thunder, well now you got it. I didn't think you had it in you. I'm your huckleberry. It's time. I'm coming to get you. I have come here to chew bubblegum and kick <clears> your <throat> ass. And I'm all out of bubblegum. Where she is called Savior, you could come up with something. If I asked you where she is called God, you could come up. If I asked you where she is called our author and our finisher, you could come up. If I asked you where she is called our high priest, you could come up with it. You can't come up with one where Jesus is called the Father by any apostle? When looking back when I was a kid, I'm arguing against modalism instead of mm. Trinitarianism. But well, also, yeah. the householder would be start defending modalism yeah. well, <laughs> a lot of times. Your defense, to your defense, too, you know, I can also help you. A lot of the Watchtower literature makes it appear that way sometimes, too. Go back and forth. You had two minutes to answer. Well, I asked you, you. You didn't clarify how long I was going to have to answer. I kept asking you how long do I have to answer. A little while ago, Travis, two minutes. Cam, you like would, you Cam, would you agree? Cam, would you agree from any of the Kelly, apostles? Kelly, from you're Paul, talking over me. Peter or John. That you you're could talking get over me. The deity of Christ. Uh, can I the gospel, answer the question? Sanctification, Dude, spiritual gifts, all that. So me. if Mary was such yeah. a prominent teaching... Can, can I you give me one reference from Paul, you talk over me? You from Paul or John or Peter's epistle? Bob, can I answer the question? Yeah, give me one answer. verse from their epistles. Just I hear where you're coming from. What you're saying, I understand what you're saying, but that's not what actually Joseph Smith is teaching. He's teaching something different than what you're saying. Yeah, that's a good point. And I would say that sentence there is kind of hard to square with the whole thing. But... Um, I'll read about it more. Thanks. You said you didn't know how they were saved. I went to Acts 15 to show you how Kelly. they were saved. So you can't Kelly. do it from the text. Kelly, listen, you still shouldn't have went there. So if you're going to try to mow me up, see, go just cut it off. Just go stop it. Go just Good evening, or morning, or afternoon, or snoring, for any of you out there. Welcome to the Brain Perspective. My name is Kelly Powers. I have to say I've got a great guest with me I'll be bringing up in just a little bit. I'm excited to learn how strawberries have evolved from whales, or whales have evolved from strawberries. Did you guys know that? Well, you're going to find that about today. I'm going to have my friend guest up here a little bit, Donnie, but just great to have you guys out here. Any new people out here, uh, anybody who's coming from Donnie's channel that may have not been here before, welcome, shalom, peace to you from grace, peace and grace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ to you. May you know the Jesus Christ of the Bible and be set free from your sins. And so tonight's a special night. Like I was just talking to my friend Donnie a moment ago, I am in a very different position tonight. Because normally I'm in the hot seat. Normally I'm out there firing back at people where today I just get to sit here and smile. I wish I had my shades. My wife has my shades in a truck day because I saw someone talking about their shades. Well, today I've got a special guest. His name is Donnie. He comes from the Standing for Truth channel. You know, many of you know him out there. He stands for biblical um, you know, creation, young earth, defending what the Bible teaches, and also the evidence that comes from science, not just fiction and made up stuff and things like that. This is real, tangible stuff. And so I am going to bring up my buddy, my partner here, my friend, and just great to have him here. And so, Donnie, welcome here, brother. Great to have you on my channel. Well, I appreciate uh, being a guest here on your show, uh, The Heresy Slayer. It's a privilege. It's an honor. And uh, like you were saying, brother, uh, it, it it feels different, but it feels nice uh, having the roles reversed. So yeah. I'm in the hot seat and, and you're the host. You get to sit back and relax tonight. So it's, it's gonna happy be to fun. be here. It's going to be great. So it's going to be great. It's going to be tons of fun. Just relax, casual atmosphere. Just, you know, hanging out. Apparently, there's some people in the background. Very excited for you being here. The screen in the background. The neighbors here. They said, Donnie! Donnie's here! Ah! The crowd goes wild! 
So um, must be some teenagers going by. Well, it's great to have you, Donnie. And it's a pleasure always being on your channel. I think I've done, I think, six or so debates. And uh, it's great. Looking forward to doing some others coming down the road. But it's not about me today. It's about you. So, Donnie, share with me, because some of the stuff I'm going to be learning new for myself, maybe even some of the people that are familiar with your channel, why don't we start off a little bit about who Donnie was before you became a Christian and how you became a Christian? Good question, uh, Kelly. And um, first thing I want to say is I don't get that kind of uh, round of applause here at my house. So uh, <laughs> very cool. I'll, I'll have to show that to my wife. And kids. <laughs> <laughs> right, so, you got to work uh, on that one for me for now on. All right, there yeah, you go. There we go. The audience is probably thinking Kelly and Donnie planned that for sure. That's right. And, it's uh, all, you're it's partly all right. <laughs> so, uh, good question. Yeah, I um, I grew up. I was never an atheist, so I'm happy to say I, I was never an atheist. I never believed that you know everything came from nothing, and uh, all of this science fiction religion that that we hear about in the atheist community but i did uh, grow up catholic hmm. and uh you know went to a catholic uh, grade school high school and i think it was in in high school in religion class when i started to have um thoughts about my worldview. All I really knew in high school was Catholicism. I thought that was Christianity. I didn't know anything about, you know, Protestants. I didn't know what young earth creation was. And so I remember in, I think it was grade 11 religion class, having some questions about the Bible, the Adam and Eve story, Noah's Ark, uh, you know, the account in Exodus, some of these amazing stories that we're so familiar with. And uh, the religion teacher at that time, and this was consensus in, in public, at least the public or the uh, Catholic school I went to for high school, was, you know, these were just allegorical. These were uh, meant to be taken as nice stories, but not actually uh, literal history, hmm. right? They would teach us, we're not dealing with a literal historical account when it comes to Adam and Eve when it comes to Noah's Ark, the global flood, so on and so forth. So to me, that that kind of threw me off a little bit. I had a, um, a lot of questions on my mind because as I read the Bible, I thought, you know, there, there's nowhere in these stories that, that give us the impression that what we're dealing with here is just allegorical and, and not to be taken as historical accounts um, or just the history of the universe. And so from, from then on, I would say going into high school, you know, I became more distant from Catholicism. And in college, I, I went through nursing. So we mm. had courses in biology, chemistry, pharmacology, all, all these different things. And so I learned the sciences. We learned about evolution. Um, mm -hmm. And so I kind of just blindly believed it. Mm -hmm. Right. We evolved from ape-like ancestors, so on and so forth. And I, I would say I, I was agnostic religion wise, but I still believed in God. And it wasn't until shortly after college that I got saved. Thank God. Believe the they gospel. Just, you heard the crowd just scream saying you got saved. They screamed right then. <laughs> We've got a great crowd back here. Let me tell you. Yeah. They're right. a, a, the perfect time to, to rock right. out that they're soundboard, right. Right? right? Salvation, getting right. saved. So, um, it, it's hard to say, you know, did I come to young earth creation or did I get saved first? Mm -hmm. Because I started off Kelly, like a lot of people where I got really involved in the debates, but the debates I got involved in were not specifically creation evolution. They were more so evidence for God debates. John Lennox, you know, upstairs, I got a big book right, called John, Lennox, John Lennox, Frank yeah. Turek, William Lane Craig, right, right. Uh, you know, these warriors for the faith, I guess you could say, but those were more so like evidence for God, evidence for, um, you know, the, the supernatural things like that. And then eventually that was like a gateway into, uh, eventually discovering young earth creation, which fascinated me because these evidence for God debates showed me that there's, there's a God, there's a designer, but the next question, the next logical question is what, Kelly? Who's the God? Who's the God, right? right? Is it Allah? Is it Buddha? You know, is it Christianity? 
Um, and so that's when I discovered the world of creation evolution mm. and um, started watching all the different young earth creation debates that, that were out there. And uh, those ones at the time that were taking place in universities, the evolutionists were getting slaughtered. Hmm. So that opened my mind hmm. and eventually I became a young earth creation uh, creationist. So got saved in the midst of um, my experiences with, with debates. I, I've always been into um, seeking truth through debates, dialogue, things like that. I've always been a competitive person. So it was debates that kind of removed the blinders and, and gave, made me open to the gospel. Yeah. And so how many you know, years? Ago about seven like, years now. So it's seven years. Awesome. Okay, you're prophetic. I was asking any prophet. Look at this. We've got a hype crowd and you're prophetic. I just said how many years, and you said it bam, just like that. Man, you're on fire. This is good. <laughs> you know, now back when you were younger and you were not Christian yet, and you had a Catholic background, you said, was that like your family? What was that like? That's a good question. Yeah, it was, uh, <laughs> excuse me, it was my family. You know, I grew up, um, It's I, I wouldn't say our family was the kind of uh, Catholic family that went to mass every Sunday, you mm -hmm. know, made sure that we were up on everything. You know, I, I was baptized as a baby, right? So, um, and then, you know, experience Eucharist, reconciliation, all these kinds of things. We'd go to mass for, you know, the important events like Christmas, Easter, things right, like that. Right, right. Those two times a year, you got to make sure you yeah. get <laughs> <The> two times. <laughs> and then you show up late and then you leave early. So <laughs> that's, right. that's right. In and out kind of thing. Um, you know, and that's when I started, ex when I did experience non-Catholic preaching, you know, that was really an eye opener to me, right? Just some fire breathing Baptist preaching. And I was just mm. like, okay, this is all, this is motivating. You know, this is what it's about God's word. Um, so yeah, my, my, most of my family at the time was, was Catholic and yeah. just kind of born into that. Right. Yeah. And then Catholic grade school, Catholic high school. So at least the, the one good thing about that mm. is you still grow up uh, believing in God. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and some of their doctrines, correct, like the Trinity and things like that. So, right. Yeah. Because like when I grew up, my parents were not Christians when I was born. And I've shared some of my story. They became Christians when I was three. And my dad was an atheist, a God hater and became a Christian. And then I became a Christian at the age of six. But then my parents divorced when I was around 10. And then my dad remarried a few times. I and mean, this is not always a good thing, but he eventually married one that he was with for 17 years before he passed on. And she was a Sicilian and she was a diehard Roman Catholic. And so I entered into the Sicilian mob. And uh, let me tell you what, when, you know, uh, they, they, they brought guns to the communion. No, I'm just joking. But um, <laughs> it was pretty ferocious. And there was lots of uh, arguments. Sometimes my dad and my mom, I remember growing up. So when you, I didn't know about your background there. So that's interesting. So, some of uh, both of us a little bit have some of that in uh, our younger years, but it's great to hear. Now, when you were before, again, before Christian and you were listening to these debates back in the day, you know, like these universities, what can you reflect on some of those things back in those days that you heard that maybe kind of caught your attention that maybe you didn't really think things through before that? Good question. So, um, I guess a little bit before the creation versus evolution debates, when I got into, uh, actually the funny thing is I went down a road of, uh, Catholicism related debates because mm. I had such a history in it. I was like, well, I want to make sure I'm right in that. So I did take a deep dive in, into that topic. And so I watched every single, you know, Roman Catholic versus Protestant debate that I could find. Mm. Um, and then the debates on like evidence for design with John Lennox, William Lane Craig, Frank Turek and the yeah. atheists, you know, were, were getting slaughtered. And I'd like to say that I, I went into those with an open mind coming out of college. I was taught evolution. I didn't really have a problem with it. So I still didn't really have a problem with it because it was just evidence for design and God. And a lot of these guys are theistic evolutionists anyways. Um, but again, like we said earlier, it doesn't really answer the question, which God. 
Right. And so uh, what really jumped out at me when I started watching the creation versus evolution debates is just how flimsy, just how weak the arguments for evolution. And we'll get into like, what do you mean by evolution and things like that a little bit later. Yeah. But the evidence is that I were taught in mm -hmm. college for evolution. Yeah. Those were the same lines of evidence that were employed and utilized in these debates mm. and they would get absolutely decimated <laughs> you know so it, it caught me by surprise i was like and certain questions th that i had my brother who was in the military at the time he got saved before me mm. so he him and i would argue for hours almost a day on the phone about like noah's <laughs> ark and things like that and i would i would scoff like the scoffers do today you know yeah, yeah. i would be like well, you're talking about noah's ark is real a global flood <laughs> dinosaurs on the ark you know all these different Unicorn things corn fly and all this stuff yes right right you know dinosaurs and, and man coexisting give me a break kind of that's thing right so, so like that, yeah so i was stubborn i was stubborn at first so that's why you know we got to be patient with these atheists and these skeptics yes. these evolutionists because i was stubborn yeah and uh, if we had recordings of all of these you know offline debates that my brother and i would have oh man you know i would sound like the evolutionists oftentimes that i debate yeah so you know that's a good the last point thing I'll say up, johnny that's a great point no that's i think because you speak from experience where you're coming from and especially because tonight's a little bit more different than my normal focus of trinity gospel or whatever heresy i'm repeating out there but um, this is really talking about like the evidence of creation and evolution. And a lot of times in my experiences back in the day, when I would be out doing street witnessing and talking to people, you know, a lot of times they would laugh at you, mock you, cuss at you, do vulgar things, intentionally try to rival you up. And you had to just kind of like, you just kind of had to have thick skin and say, you know what, whatever. And just kind of just show them respect, show them patience, show them that you actually care. You know, they don't really care how much you know till they know how much you care. That's a pretty common phrase out there, right? And so sometimes with atheists, just like someone who's caught up in a cult, it takes time to go through that process. And so talk about some of that with some of that, as you were starting to see these things, now you were, the layers are starting to come down and light was starting to come in. Right. Exactly. You said it perfectly. Light was coming in, you know, the, the blinders were being removed and so it challenged my worldview, but I feel like it's where God led me starting with, as I pointed out earlier in high school, when I had these questions and because the only ones that were giving me answers were the Catholic teachers at the time and, and mm. the Catholic church, I wasn't satisfied with those answers. So when I did come to the world of creation, biblical creation, and the fact that the science, the science, the empirical science supported a literal interpretation of Genesis. You know, Genesis claims to be the history book of the universe. And we, right. we can test this. We can test its claims to scientific data. And it just turns out that it's perfectly consistent. And it was like a light bulb. I was, I was enlightened, Kelly. I was enlightened. Questions that I had years before, yeah. you know, grade 10, grade 11 were, were finally being answered like that's cool creation you can believe the bible you you can trust god's word i mean the bible says holy men spake as they're moved by the holy ghost so true you know this is this is the word of god brother and um it really was a, an adventure and it still is an adventure it was yeah. i had so much fun that first year just taking a deep dive into all the debates the lectures the seminars yeah. the discussions like you were at a toy store it's like a toy store. Yeah. And, and, and it never ending, but then it did end, you know, it got to a point where I felt like I watched every single debate. Yeah. I watched every yeah. single discussion. And what yeah. did I do? Started my own channel. There you go. Set up my own debates. And now, now you're living, about now you're living of them. Yeah. Now you're making history for other people. There you go. There yeah. you go. No, that's good. That's good. You know, I can remember uh, one particular guy when I was in my early twenties and I was in Las Vegas and uh, I was a valet parker for different locations downtown in Las Vegas. And uh, I got transferred to this one spot fashion show mall down on the Las Vegas Strip, close to the Mirage. And there was about 11 of us at, at, that were working at this location for valet parkers. And about half of us were actually Christians. And um, when I got transferred to this spot, 
these guys were like saying, we're so happy you're here, Kelly. We're so, I'm like, why, why, why would you be happy? And like, well, there's this guy, this guy over here, he's always mocking us and making fun of us and just slandering and this and that. And we just don't know how to deal with this guy. And I said, well, you just go take that. No, I didn't say that. But anyway, I said, <laughs> you know, okay, well, uh, I'll meet the guy. And so, you know, cause I have a little bit, a little bit of thick skin. I was bullied when I was younger. I learned, you know, how to stand up bullies. I learned how to protect my friends when I needed to. So I've, I've learned how to kind of deal with certain people when I've had to. And so when someone gets vulgar in your face, I'm like, that's the best you got. So it was funny as this guy, uh, I'll give you the short version because this is more about you than me, but it's about what you just said though, because he was mocking, making fun of and trying to razzle me now that I was this guy over there. And I, I, I kind of, said is that supposed to bother me why don't you prove what you believe right. and so he'd make fun of me and you'll laugh because he was making like saying names about christians and whatever else and we'd use walkie talkies so when i needed to call him one day i decided to call him a goat worshiper i said hey goat worshiper have you sacrificed any goats today he's like what i said yeah I said, you can't say that i said why not well the bible said i said where does it say that and so I started kind of to start trying to slowly challenge him a little intellectually. And we started getting into some debates and then we started hanging out, started having dinner together, hanging out, having debates, starting to become friends. And about six months later, that man became a Christian. Wow. But Praise the Lord. He was a hard one to knock because he was a mocker, a slanderer. And so what I learned to do is I just learned to relate to him where he was at. And instead of trying to be this wimpy Christian or just to try to calm all these, you know, your, your, your anti whatever, I actually befriended this guy and allowed him to give me his best shots. And then over time, those layers started coming down. And then when he started, when we went through the evolution creation thing and I shared some books with him. We had conversations. One of them was a guy named Mark Eastman, former evolution Christian. He wrote, wrote a little book called Creation by Design. And it was just a little book. And over the weekend, my friend read it and he says, calls me up, Kelly, dude, evolution sucks. <laughs> <laughs> and so like you said a minute ago, so now we had to talk about who's God. And so we started talking about the history of the Bible, evidence of who Jesus is, crucifixion, resurrection, and through all that, then he became a born again believer. And so Amen. we go through those steps. All right. So now you're a Christian. You went through all those debates you went through your toy toy store experience which i remember doing that years ago with my apologetic stuff now so now i can relate a little bit too um so now what let's go back how many ever years ago how long you've been doing your kind of ministry that you're doing take us back to the beginning good question so i've been studying the topic now for i mean since my conversion and a little before, obviously, since, you know, there's always a time that leads up to your conversion. Um, and so, you know, I've got a slew of books that I've studied on the creation, evolution, intelligent design topic, uh, Christian apologetics. And once I was introduced to the world of YouTube, I was saying earlier that I've always <laughs> been competitive growing up in high school. And then in college, I did. I, lo I, I enjoyed a lot of like combat sports, one on one sports. So nice. I, you know, I did wrestling, coached wrestling, nice. did judo, grappling, all these things. Did you? That's so fun. Awesome. I, I like the pressure, you know, and I find debating yeah. gives me that those same feelings. Nice. You know, as, as, as odd as it may sound to some people, right? It, one of my best friends in high school was into wrestling and judo as well. And when we would do grappling, he would always kick my butt. But if we were standing up, he didn't have a chance. Right. <laughs> so you beat him up in the... Yeah. Uh... I had to make sure he didn't take me to the ground. If he took me to the ground, I was done. Oh. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, so it's those same kinds of feelings. And it's what I think drove me when I um, was confronted with the world of YouTube and uh, the debates that were going on, the live debates. And there were not as many going on then as there are now. Um, at the time it felt like there were a lot of debates going on. There's a couple of debate channels. There's a lot of open mics and things like that. But I thought to myself, I was like the arguments that these evolutionists are using, that these atheists are using, you know, I felt confident that, that I can refute those. So I looked into how I can jump into these streams, you know, and, and if you've never jumped into a stream, it may, um, 
feel difficult. Like, how do I do this? You know, and obviously it's relatively easy. Back then it was the uh, Google Hangouts. I'm sure you're familiar with Google oh, Hangouts. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it was totally different. And, um, you know, I learned how to jump in and I started just, I just jumped right in. I jumped into, I remember at the time, uh, a relatively popular atheist channel, militant atheist channel. And within the next few hours I was debating, I think it was like eight, eight atheists on one. That's and awesome. I just loved it. You know, there were scientists in that room. And ever since then I was just jumping in open mics. I started doing formal debates, but I felt that the atheist channels at the time that were hosting debates, mm -hmm. I felt they, they were less than professional in the sense that it wasn't really fair for the creationist side. Because oftentimes, <laughs> and if people are listening that know what I'm talking about, uh, they will relate for sure. You'd get the creationist in there, but even the moderator, who's supposed to be as neutral as possible, he'd get in on the debate. So you had an atheist moderator, you'd have the atheist who's debating, it'd be like a two or three on one. So that's when I started saying, you know what? I'm going to build a debate platform. I'm a debater, I'm clearly a young earth creationist, but what I'm going to do when I host and moderate, I am going to make sure that I'm neutral, I'm as unbiased as possible. When I'm in the debate octagon, I mean, I'm bringing the heat, that's my mm -hmm. goal. But when I'm moderating, I'm making sure that the debate is is fair, equally timed, professional, sophisticated. And so uh, since then now, it's been about three years. You asked how long I've been doing the ministry for. I'd say about three or four, you're probably closer to four years because Kelly, the last two years have kind of just all blended together, as you know. Um, and now I've hosted about 180 debates on all sorts of topics. And um, uh, if you anybody who's not familiar with my channel, if you check it out, I've now done about 110 like interviews, lectures with PhD scientists, biblical scholars, flood geologists, researchers, abiogenesis wow. uh, researchers, things like that. So it's it's been fun. It's been an adventure, brother, as I think. Now you have did. Kent Hoven on your channel. That name, I don't need to say anything else. Kent Hoven, right? Um, talk about him now kind of being a part of your channel that really brings a nice element to your channel as well, right? Yes. Yeah. Good question. So Kent, Dr. Dino, he was the one. So <laughs> years ago when I was watching the like uh, design debates, evidence for God debates, you know, the John Lennox versus Richard Dawkins debates, those are fascinating. I've seen them a ton of times. But when you type in creation versus evolution debates, it's typically 99% Ken Hoven debates because he's done so many. I think he's done about 285 at this point. So. Right, right. <laughs> he, he, he is the goat. He's the he, goat. Yeah. <laughs> he's done the most. He's the, Other than du Dr. Dwayne Gish, he's done over 300. Wow. But you can't really find them online, unfortunately. They, I think they were done too long ago. They weren't recorded. Yeah. So Kent's were recorded in the universities. So I didn't know who he was, but my brother said, this is the guy you have to look into. So I watched all his debates open-mindedly. And uh, one of his debates, it was a three-on-one. He slaughtered the three atheists. Uh, Michael Shermer, he debated all these big names. And I liked his approach because he was respectful, but he also came in to debate. Mm -hmm. Right. He, he debates to debate to yeah. expose the opponent's side and attack the arguments, obviously not the opponent. So when I first started my channel, he was one of the first uh, apologists that, that I called. Mm -hmm. You know, he's very easy to get a hold of. He gives everybody his number, gave him a call. Hey, I'm so and so. I'm Donnie. Nice to meet you. You've been very influential. Did you want to um, start coming on my channel for debates? And he yeah. was all for it. Right. Okay. So that was now three years ago. I think I've had him on for debates about 60 times now. Wow. It's crazy. So he's, yeah, he's still going strong and he always makes for an entertaining debate. You know what I, li and I like about him is he's, he's a name. He's been around. He's debated some big names. He's done his stuff. He's done his work. He's older, but he's still fired up and going you know, with the blaze in the fire, right? Like he's just still shooting out there. And I like what you just said too, is that he came on your channel. You're just a, you know, a whoever, you know, back in the day and whatever, like we're, we're, we're not like out there on CNN or Fox news, or whatever else. we're just <laughs> doing what we do because this is what we believe God called us to do. But Dr. Dino comes on your channel and now kind of partners with you, if, if you will, for ministry 
I just think that's really neat that, that him being that kind of willing servant to not have a pride issue or a puffed up issue like, oh, I'm Dr. Dino. I'm not, you know what I mean? Like, he's like, hey, <laughs> give me a call. Here I am, right? Like, I think that's that is so cool to hear about him. Tell us about just some of his character there because I don't really know the guy, but obviously you've gotten to know him over time now. Well, right there, you just nailed it. I had 50 subscribers. Okay. You know, 50, now, subscribers. 50 right. subscribers. I'm a nobody. I've done a few open mics. I've done a few videos that maybe hit a hundred views. And back then you hit a hundred views. You're like, Oh gosh, here we I go. I'm it it big. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, when I reached out to him, th there was no question. It wasn't like, well, what is your channel? How big is your channel? Who have you had on? He was just ha happy to help happy to um, assist in, in building the platform and, and you know, help with the vision that, that I had. It didn't matter how popular he was. Um, he was always willing to come on. So we formed a good relationship. And at the very end of, uh, so he's very generous with his time. He's crazy busy up early in the morning. He gives tour after tour over at Dinosaur Adventureland. Nice. I have uh, one specific uh, buddy, uh, a good friend who, is currently living there helping with the ministry. And so, you know, he's got plenty of good things to say, great stories. And, um, you know, Kent's a hard worker and he'll still at the end of the day, being up all day since six in the morning, he comes on, he does a debate, you know, eight o'clock EST for a couple hours. So at the very end of 2021, him and I had a long conference call mm -hmm. and we said, what are we going to do to challenge the evolutionary community for 2022? So after lots of discussion, we said, you know what? We're going to put out a 2022 evolution debate challenge series. Kind of like how you've been doing, brother, with the oneness, mm. right? You're just debating all the oneness proponents. And I'm saying, so, bring it on. Give me your best on. guy. Give me your bring best guy. <laughs> Identical to that. So we put out the video. We made a professional video, put it out, spread the word. And now we've been doing about, uh, about two a week if you're an evolutionist and you're willing to debate what's your best evidence for evolution, you know, we set it up, we make sure it's fair and, and we do it. It's been good. I think we've done now about 30 of them in 2022. So. And that um, shows Christ like character right there, because he's in it to serve, to bless, to see people get saved. It's not about popularity, even though that can have a, a good, uh, an effect, of course. But that's not the motivation. That's not the drive. Like, you know, with me, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm almost, what am I, five, fifty, five hundred, whatever it is. But I mean, back in the day, you know, I was just nothing, whatever. But I've always had this attitude. I bring people on my channel all the time that I don't care if they're, you know, a nobody, if you will. That's not meant in the wrong way. You guys know what I mean? Not known, whatever. That's to me, it's not about that. It's about ministry. It's about right. serving. It's about. If, if, if this only gets 100, 200 views tonight or whatever, I'm still content because 200 people came and listened. And I'm praying that those people who came, they're blessed and encouraged. I'd rather have 200 people encouraged, blessed, than have thousands and thousands of views and nobody really cares what they just watched. Amen. It's about ministry. Amen. And so that speaks volumes for Kent Hovind because what he's got over 200,000 subscribers, right? Right. And he keeps right. coming back to your channel. <laughs> yeah, it shows that he's in it to to serve, as you pointed out, uh, just like yourself. You know, you're you're a busy brother, and yet you're still doing debate after debate. I think I've had you on six or seven times now. I've got a playlist titled Kelly Powers Debate. So you're a fan favorite to anybody in the audience who loves what they see from Kelly. Check out that playlist. Hours, hours of fun. One thing I like about Kent's approach is here's the thing. There are a ton of amazing amazing um, creationist apologists, PhD scientists, where they give really technical arguments, right? And I've written now about six or seven books, some of them very technical and some of them written for the layperson. So what Kent does is he takes the really technical arguments and he brings them down to the layperson level. I love it. Right. His DVDs, his debates, those are what I send to friends, family. And I've got a good anecdotal story is I was sitting. It must have been either Easter or Christmas dinner. I had my agnostic, skeptical friend. 
at the dinner table and I was hammering him with all the technical arguments that I've learned, right? In genetics, you know, genetic entropy, taste accumulation, mitochondrial leave, Y chromosome, no. And you can just see it's all going over his head, even though they're powerful arguments. And so I was like, you know, I'm, I'm going to change it up. And, and I started doing the Kent Hoven approach. I said, think about it, brother. I said, okay, what do we see today? Science means to know, right? How do we know? Te testing, observations, uh, retesting, so on and so forth. Dogs produce dogs, pine trees produce pine trees, but yet the evolutionist wants to say that pine trees and dogs are related through common ancestry. That's not what we see. And that just clicked for him. Mm -hmm. You know, that just clicked. So it took a very lay person argument, a lay level argument to actually open his eyes. And that's what Maybe I appreciate. Strawberries didn't evolve from whales. <laughs> <laughs> That is breaking my heart right now, Donnie. I know. It broke my heart. When I <laughs> when I discovered when I discovered that pine trees, strawberries, and whales are not related through common oh, ancestry, man. that's what I was taught in college. So when I realized that wasn't the truth, broke my heart. That's, it broke my heart. You know, that is what you just said about Kent Hoven and what you're doing. I, I appreciate that because you're learning. You are learning from Kent Hoven. He's kind of in a way been a, a good mentor for you, someone that you've been able to learn from and also learn how to apply it in your own life. Am I right? That's right. So That's right. what you just said about taking like something really complicated, but then bringing it down where the, you know, the average Joe, if you will, the layman can grasp, right? I learned that years ago from the late Dr. Walter Martin, though I never met him. And the late Dr. Walter Martin, who was in the cults and apologetics, he, he basically said, look, we have got to learn how to get the hay off the loft onto the floor so the cows can come and feed from it. Amen. And a lot of times what happens in the apologetics realm, whether it's cults or creation and design and all these things, people speak this language as it goes over your head, over your head. I used to make jokes when I was listening to different apologists. I'm going, I'll be with someone and go, dude, do you got a dictionary for what that guy just said? Cause I have no idea what he's talking about. <laughs> right. Like, dude, what's going on? Right. Like right. sometimes these guys just have to sound so, complicated and so smart and like okay about 1.1 percent of the people are going to grasp what you just said dude if that you know and so i like what you just said about kent because that breaks it down where you can still share intelligence and evidence and factual information but you share it in a way that people can actually grasp from it and i like what you just shared there amen and one thing a lot is because and, and i'm sure you could relate to this on YouTube, we battle the most militant of critics. I battle the most militant uh, evolutionists who, according to the Bible, those that are um, just as militant as a lot of these ones are online, you know, the Bible says they're willingly ignorant. Second Peter 3, I love. You know, in the last days, there's going to be scoffers walking after their lust, denying three things, the creation, the flood, the coming judgment. Those are the three things, essentially, we, we argue about online. But your everyday person, for the most part, people I worked with, family, friends, they are not so anti-God like that where you can break down these technical arguments into an easy to understand way and it clicks for most people. Mm -hmm. And I've noticed that um, just in real time interactions, evangelizing, soul winning, having these discussions, that's 99% of the population. Yep. It's technical arguments are good, but a lot of people, they're, they're more so receptive to the common sense, the logical arguments. <laughs> Um, that I think Ken Hoven does a fantastic job implementing. It's it's very successful in churches, uh, Bible study groups, things like that. So yeah, totally. You know, just one quick side note is like a guy that's been on my channel for a little while, who's been oneness and kind of you know attacking the Trinity for a long time on my channel, making comments not completely horrible, but just been really anti. Well, recently I've been talking with him. He's been talking to me on through chats here and there, and then. That last debate I had on your channel with Rodney, yeah. when I was pressing the Holy Spirit in John 14, 15, and 16, just from the pronouns themselves, this oneness guy has now realized the oneness view is wrong. That's amazing. Praise the Lord, brother. It's allowing the word of God to speak for itself, right? So it's it's keeping things simple and practical and letting people to see it for themselves. So that's great. All right. Great Actually, let me say this there. if I could real quick, because oh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. what you said there is so important.
because I've had a lot of people over the years say, you know, why the debates? Why so many debates? They're useless. They'll even try and say the Bible, you know, uh, is is anti-debate kind of thing. But what you just said is so important. And I've noticed it in my personal life with own my own family members, um, but with so many other people in their testimonies, debates are oftentimes not really for who you're debating. Although we want them to be saved and come to the of knowledge of the truth. Of but how many debaters convert during the debate, right? Very few. But for the audience, those that are on the fence, those that are looking for answers, seeking answers to challenges that they've heard, debates are a very, very good way of, as we've been talking about, removing the blinders and making them open or receptive to what? The gospel. Yeah the saving gospel of, of Jesus Christ. I experienced it. Many people have experienced it from what? From debates. And you just had a beautiful story there where somebody who's oneness, rejecting the Trinity, watches your debate, watches what a fantastic job you do upholding the uh, the triune God of the Bible and converts, sees yeah. the error of their ways. It's, it's, it's beautiful. beautiful. I mean, it, and it's, it, it all goes back to just what, why do we do what we do? It's not for us. It's for the people. Yeah. Amen. Amen. All right. Beautiful to hear your story. Beautiful to hear that. Um, great to hear your growth and, and how your channel has been impacting. I think you're almost at 10,000 subscribers now. Praise the Lord for that. Um, I think you're almost done with writing a book right now. Yeah, good question. Well, I'm, I'm working on... Uh, three more, but I, I always make sure I've got a lot of projects. So this Are you is trying to be I, like one of the church fathers back in the day when they wrote like a thousand books, <laughs> except their books were like 3000 pages. Mine they were, were like a couple monsters, yeah. right? They had no wives. They had no <laughs> wives. That's why they had no lives. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. No wives. And therefore <laughs> just write, you know, from the moment you get up in the morning, they were all single. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably why they were single. Yeah. So um, I just finished this book. So this is the cover right here. Nice. It's nice. called the um, Endogenous Retrovirus Handbook. A lot of I'll, people. I'll put that saying, link for it later. If you give me the link, I'll put it in the description later. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. So a lot of people in the chat are probably like an endogenous what? You know, that was the reaction of my uh, parents and friends when they gave them when I gave them a copy. Uh, but it was written. So I have. A, I'll say this first. I have other books. This is a short and sweet one. I wrote this one. It's called the Independent Origins Handbook. And Short and sweet, called? just about a hundred pages. It's written for, for the layperson to understand. Take technical arguments. You know, I've got pictures and things in it. Break things down. Address the uh, common arguments for evolution and show why the creation model better explains the data. This written, one written for the layman, so most people can grasp it. Amen, amen. So that's the one I really hand out in in like my personal kind of cool. walk and journey. Cool. Um, this one is titled dismantling the best evidence for common descent, which nice. is what's called endogenous retroviruses. So this is what like your PhD scientists of the world that are evolutionary biologists, your R and Ra's of the world, you know, these are the lines of evidence they'll look to. And for those kinds of arguments, they do require a technical rebuttal. So this isn't essentially, this is not essentially written for everybody but it is written for those that want a very comprehensive response mm. to their best arguments. Okay. As you deal with a lot of the oneness arguments and the, the, the different heresies, yeah. there's easier to refute arguments. And then there's other arguments that like, you know, let's say they're top dogs utilize right. that might require a little bit more work. Yeah. Yeah. There's always a key verse here and there that every group has that they kind of latch onto. Um, and then, you know, and you, and you kind of know where to go from there. There's other ones that are a little bit simpler. And so it's the same thing I'm sure with evolution creation, there's always going to be those, those rockets they shoot out and they think, Oh, I, you know, how am I going to handle that? And so some of them are a little bit more tricky to deal with. I get that. Right. Right. So how many books have you have so far? Six, you say? I've got about six, as a ministry, there's a team of us. Yeah. So if you do go to our website, sanfordtruthministries.com. Okay. You can go to the Our Team section and uh, just scroll to the bottom of the homepage. There's myself, uh, a retired engineer named uh, George Bond, nice. a retired geologist who actually taught for the Institute of Creation Research 
And his name is Professor David McQueen. He's my team geologist. He's been a huge blessing. Right. I've got his book behind me, actually. And then uh, Matt Naylor. He's the one that it kind of, uh, you know, we came together three years ago and we, he's like my co ministry creator, if, if you could say that. So uh, Victory Street Ministry, appreciate that, brother. Um, yeah, amen. amen. So you can check the the my team section. So as as a team, we've written probably close to about sixteen books. Myself alone, about six now. So if you do go to the website, you'll see a whole slew of of books that that we've read, including Professor David McQueen. He's written books as well. Now, in your kind of your personal preference, like you mentioned, people like Frank Turek, and Frank Turek is kind of a a smorgasbord of stuff though he does deal with science creation evolution but he also deals with lots of bible question and answers things like that with cults and whatever else john lennox is like a mathematician he's huge um really good with creation really good with those kind of things very logical um what are what are a couple guys right now that you think are like definitely the two or three go-to guys if somebody was wanting to kind of maybe start where you're at now or where you used to be, what would you suggest to some people? That's a good question. Well, um, other than yourself, of course. Right. <laughs> so check out Standing for Truth <laughs> Ministry. Other than Donnie the man. I mean, the biblical creation answer, man. I mean, come on. <laughs> no, that's funny. Uh, well, I will say a lot of the guys I would recommend, Frank Turk being one of them, especially for Evidence for God and Christianity, I've had on the channel for discussions. He's been on your channel? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I got to go watch that. Okay. Yeah. And, and that was a great interview because we talked about a lot of the topics that I wouldn't consider my specialty, right? Are like, you know, is, is the God of the Old Testament is he evil, you know, things like that. How do we explain the problem of evil, morality, things like that uh, is what we discussed. Um, but I would definitely, re for one, I'd recommend him when it comes to, um, like you said, where I was. Yeah. If you're coming into the world of apologetics and you're just wondering, you know, is there evidence for God uh, behind me as well? I got a whole slew of his books, you know, mm -hmm. why um, I'm not an atheist or uh, what's the name of it? I don't have enough to be uh, enough faith to be an atheist. That's, That's the in the title for us. We don't have enough faith to be atheist. Amen. Amen. So he's got a ton of good books on that. John Lennox as well is great. And what I like about Frank Turek is he breaks it down as well in a way that the lay person can, can understand. One of the arguments he typically uses, and I'm going to uh, just kind of summarize it. It won't be word for word, but he, he talks a lot about uh, design and how to recognize design, intelligent design that is, in the real world. And he talks about, in one of his arguments, he, he points out that if, if we were to come downstairs in the morning, right? And my kid's alphabet cereal was, it just happened to be knocked over on the table. Mm -hmm. Be at right in the middle of the table, we saw a message, okay? And the message was, take out the garbage mom. Well, are we going to assume that, that the dog happened to knock the box over? Or a sudden earthquake shook the house in a way that allowed the cereal to spell out. Only the happened. cereal fell, but nothing else fell. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, the, the clear answer is, you know, this was a, a message due to intelligent design. Or if I was walking down a beach and I saw a, a message written in the sand, John loves Mary. Are we going to conclude the sand did it? The crabs came out of the water and made that message by accident? No, of course, we're going to conclude this is the product of, of a mind. And the one thing I want to say is Frank Turek points out that this is exactly what we see in the DNA code mm. that makes life life. Right. If we see that. a message in DNA. And there's many prominent uh, atheists, believe it or not, that admit that DNA, Kelly, is like a software program. Yeah. If there's a program, that means there's a programmer. Yes. <laughs> So we can recognize design in the real world with the example of the cereal or the message in the sand. But then you have atheists that don't want to recognize design in the biological world. 
Mm -hmm. in DNA. Every single cell, Kelly, is made up of 3 billion letters of DNA code. Mm. And this message is far more complex than any man-made message. That's right. One We're single the most, cell more complex, complex than machine out cell. there today, right? Amen. Oh, yeah. One single cell. And we have 100 trillion cells. Isn't that beautiful? That all happened just by the biogenesis. By chance, by chance, no reason at all. There's no reason, just spontaneous combustion. Just spontaneous. You know, combustion. so what you said, so I've heard this years ago, some guys that I've liked to listen to in the back in the day with answers in Genesis, uh, people like Kent, uh, Ken Ham or uh, Dr. Jonathan Safari. Um, I've been to some conferences years ago, a guy named Calvin Miller uh, with Creation Research Institute. I've been to some of these as well. He's actually been some churches I've been a part of in the past. And one of the things that I've always learned that's been fascinating to me is what you kind of just talked about DNA and the, and what's written. That's, it's actually, you know, code. It's, 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 it's actually um, this information that you can tell uh, has a, um, someone put that information in there, right? It's got uh, intelligence behind it. And I'm not wording my words as I would like to right now, but what I'm trying to say is that when you look at DNA, it's kind of like the software, and our outer bodies are like the hardware. Have right. you heard that before? Oh, yeah. Talk yeah. about that because that's, I think that's, I can't say it's probably as good as you. Talk about how important that is. Well, it's not only important, but what it means for the naturalist, Kelly, what it means for those that want to say, um, you know, the first self replicating molecule, the first single cell came from lifeless, non-living chemicals in some warm pond, it actually shows the impossibility of that, okay? Because as I was pointing out, we have 100 trillion cells, each cell on its own more com complicated than the space shuttle. And it turns out that, uh, as you pointed out, DNA codes for what would be considered the physical features of our body, right? The phenotype, technically speaking. But within this DNA, and in my book, uh, the in, uh, Independent Origins Handbook, I go over a number of what's called chicken and egg problems. And these chicken and egg problems show the impossibility of atheism, of naturalism in explaining the DNA code. And one that I like to talk about, because I think it's easier to understand, and it's just a fatal blow to evolutionism is DNA actually has the instructions to build its own coding machinery. Okay. Hmm. And to the naturalist, I like to ask them this question. So to anybody listening, ask the naturalist this question and watch how they respond, which came first, the machinery, but how do you get the machinery without the instructions or did the instructions come first, but wait a minute, naturalist. You cannot read those instructions unless you have the machinery to read it. So what I'm trying to say, Kelly, is you need everything working together right from the start. Otherwise, hmm. life could not exist. And what does the Bible say in Genesis? God created everything in six days, and it was very good. Everything was working together right from the start. So the complexity of the DNA code, as you're saying, and the fact that to build the DNA code naturalistically, has far too many chicken and egg problems. This is just one of about a hundred I can touch on. That's fascinating. Now, I know I've shared this with you before, and I've even shared this with atheists, not necessarily people who would claim to be, you know, like the PhDs, the, the evolutionist kind of professor, teacher. So I haven't had that kind of conversation, but I've said this before, and it kind of goes off what you just said. So the mutation process over billions or millions of years, the survival of the fittest, natural selection, these different terms, where we kind of get through different stages where you've got the predator and you've got the prey and whoever was the strongest, they survived. The other ones died off, right? Wow. Now, in our bodies, like you just said, like DNA, these are all these codes that's written in our body and they can even reproduce these different things, which is amazing. So in our body, we need blood to live, right? You can't right. live without blood, right? If we have blood, but we don't have a brain, we can't live as well, right? Right. If we have a brain and blood, but we don't have a heart, we can't live as well either, right? Exactly. Now, let's say if we have a heart, brain, and blood, but we don't have kidneys or a liver, we're going to die as well. So what's interesting to me 
is all of these things that we have in our body right now, how in the world could a heart, our livers, our kidneys, our blood, our brains, the bones in our bodies that keep everything together, how could everything slowly evolve and not die off? Or how could you actually have blood flowing when you have no body to go into? Where did the body come from? How can you have a body with no blood? Where'd the blood come from? How can you have a body with blood? But where'd the brain? All these things, right. as you just said, they have to happen at the same time or none of it can happen at all. Am I right? That's right. That's right. And and Charles Darwin pointed out that if there is, and the DNA code is one of them, not to mention what you talked about, the circular, how the circulatory system, the respiratory system, all these different systems in the body work in combination with each other. As in, you can't have one without the other. And this is the problem they're facing in what's called abiogenesis research, mm. origin of life research are these chicken and egg problems. You need everything working together right from the start. The start and the, the precursors that they suggest don't work. And um, you mentioned mutations and just breaks in the DNA. And it turns out that every single DNA, we don't even recognize. There's so much going on in our body that we don't even know is happening, right? But the body itself is working over time all the time. And we actually have about a million DNA breaks in our cells that are repaired without even recognizing it. We don't even notice it that are repaired by incredibly complex DNA machines. So here's another thing uh, to support what we're saying here is if we didn't actually have these um, amazingly designed chemical repair machines, we would be so mutated, Kelly, that we would not be able to survive past a few generations. But yet we have the DNA code and within the DNA code, we have these molecular machines that are constantly repairing these DNA breaks. Hmm. Um, it's, it's amazing. Uh, what's going on on the molecular level, uh, Kelly, is science fiction. You know, it's science fiction, really. And it's, it's amazing. It's, it's evidence for the Bible says that God is evident in, in his creation. Mm hmm in the creatures that he's created. You'd have to be willingly ignorant not to uh, recognize that. So, yeah, well, you know, and, and that's spectacular. And so let me ask you a question for me, for me to you mostly right now is with what I just shared with you, because it's, it's very, for me, I'm trying to be as simple as possible when I'm talking to people. And yet it's so common sense to me that if you don't have a heart, if you don't have blood, you don't have a brain. How in the world could we have life? And how could it even possibly evolve, even with just going out there within billions or whatever years, if you don't have that life in you, it's just not going to happen, right? And so I I, I I, don't mean any insult to any, because I know there's some atheists here right now, and my, some others might watch it later. I mean, no disrespect to anyone's intelligence, but doesn't that really sound like they have to believe more in what is com completely impossible than for us who are those who are looking at the evidence of the body, the DNA, looking at the structure of the universe, things how there's actual order to everything here. Doesn't it seem like there's more common sense that there is some kind of like what you said earlier with the issue of the codes designer rather than just somehow happening over time? Amazing. Just one system like you're talking about, which I love. That's just one. We could talk all day on the number of irreducibly complex is what it's called systems. These systems are made of independent systems that work together like the, the, the uh, circulatory system. You can just Google it, look it up. It consists of the heart which is cardiovascular, the lungs, which is pulmonary, the arteries and veins. <laughs> and all of these systems that are highly, that, that are amazingly designed and, and complicated, they work together for the greater function of the unit, the human being or whatever creature you're looking at. So what, what came first, the arteries or the, or the heart? You know, what, so the, the evolutionist has this just unsolvable problem not just in one system, but all systems. And it goes right down to the DNA as we've been talking about. DNA, RNA to proteins. 
the process of just protein synthesis alone, right? That just builds proteins or RNA molecules, incredibly complex. Uh, evolutionary mechanisms can't uh, account for it. It's, it's amazing. That is good stuff. That's good stuff. Well, we're at almost about an hour here and we're, we're just, we're just getting started. Apparently um, this is good stuff. This is good stuff. Let's say thank you everyone out there for being here. I, I if, if I missed any others, but uh, whoever this nice person said fast, thank you for your uh, little uh, $2 there. Appreciate you. Lord bless you. Thank you for that there. And uh, if there's been anything that I've missed, that was a specific question or anything being said, uh, just state it again. We haven't really gotten to question and answers yet. We'll see how that goes later. But one of the things that I would like to say, though, to you, Donnie, is like, so in your research now with, you know, looking at the evidence of, you know, biblical creation, young earth, I was even talking really earlier about there's there are some people today who are like in the apologetics realm, if you will, uh, you know, people like William Craig Lane or others who kind of have a view where, they kind of have this, this seems to be the more old earth perspective where, you know, people like Adam and Eve really weren't real historical people. Noah's flood didn't have, even like, even like what you said, that's how you were back in the day. These guys, you know, there's no way these guys existed. Right. So it's almost like they're, they're believing in God because God caused this old earth, this theistic evolution to take place. But they also don't hold to what the scripture says about these historical significant information of facts of, of history what wh where do you lie with that how do you respond to people who are not the young earth people but they do believe in god maybe just kind of take it from there great question and uh we could talk all day on this so i'll kind of break it down in a nutshell kelly if you don't mind like you to we go all night yeah we're gonna <laughs> Uh, it's going to be an all-nighter, guys. So get ready. Unlimited Buckle energy. Buckle up, everybody. We're I going get for another a ride. <laughs> uh, if you could share my screen real quick, bro. I can share that screen with you, buddy. Appreciate there it. Go. Appreciate it. So if we, um, that's a great question. Actually, before I go so over some of these verses, you know, you have different um, models when it comes to uh, what I would call biblical compromise theistic evolutionism, progressive creationism, gap theory, old earth creation. Uh, William Lane Craig, he's a theistic evolutionist. He put out a book recently on that topic. Um, but what I find interesting is, first of all, a lot of these um, theistic evolutionists, they'll say that, you know, if you're young earth creationist, the atheist says the same thing. You know, we see evolution, evolution's a fact, like gravity. And so, you know, these young earth creationists, you know, they hurt the cause of Christianity more than anything. So this is what I wanted to make clear to the audience is we don't have a problem with evolution. If by evolution, you mean, if you just Google evolution, Kelly, evolution just means change over time hmm. or biological evolution in technical terms means a change in what's called allele frequencies in populations or in, in over generations or time. Allele frequencies being a genetic variant, okay? But uh, in its barest form, it just means change over time. Okay, well, we see that. I mean, we've artificially come up with over 400 different breeds of dogs, right? From your Great Dane to your Bulldog to your, your Chih Tzu to your um you know to your husky and all this based on essentially just the shuffling of what's called pre-existing dna variety that that god would have initially front loaded into his created kind so the point is if by evolution and this is why in every debate you should always on this topic kelly you should always define terms right evolution what do you mean by evolution if by evolution you mean that as you can see here on the screen you know, dogs, domestic dogs and wolves, and even coyotes are related. Sure, we don't have a problem with that, right? That's something we can observe. That's something we can test. That's something we can verify through empirical scientific data. That's science. But if you look over here on fairy tale, if by evolution you mean, and this is what the evolutionists actually mean, if um, it's the fallacy of e e equivalency. Mm. Right. False equivalency. They want to say, well, just because we see change, just because we see dogs producing a variety of dogs 
That must mean then they extrapolate an extrapolation fallacy. That must mean dogs, banana plants, strawberries, I whales. And all you, the yeah. I, want, I don't mean to interrupt you at all because that's not, but you got to add a strawberry in there, please. <laughs> right. You got to right. add a strawberry. Okay. That's please add a strawberry. Right. Okay. Okay. So let's pretend this banana is a strawberry. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a strawberry banana. Yeah, it's a strawberry banana <laughs> milkshake. The strawberry bananas came from they came from bananas. <laughs> <laughs> strawberry banana smoothie, you know, there healthy, you perfect way to start your morning. <laughs> and um, so a strawberry, a banana plant, you know, a whale, well, you name it. If you look at the universal, what's called tree of life that evolutionists believe in, on the tree, you've got you know, strawberries, whales dinosaurs dogs all all coming from at the base of the tree coming from a single solid like ancestor right so everything's related to them that is a fairy tale that is what we would reject so that's why it's it's important again to define your terms what do you mean by evolution okay here's a funny slide here that that i like to uh look to because evolutionists they like to look to time as you know, being the hero of the story. Okay. So if you look at this meme here, you know, a frog turning into a prince instantly, that's obviously a fairy tale, right, Kelly? But a, a frog turning into a prince after millions of years and evolutionary processes and mechanisms, you know, apparently that's science. That's well, the truth is, <laughs> right. The, the, the truth, it's both a fairy tale. Frogs today are producing frogs, humans today are producing humans. That's right. Okay. Time, that doesn't yeah, in any really way time. mean that. Yeah. yeah. Here's a good acronym for those to uh, remember, to make it understandable is farm. Okay. Fish, amphibian, reptile, mammal. Hmm. So evolutionists, they believe billions of years ago, okay, there was non-living chemicals. We talked about abiogenesis earlier. From non-living chemicals, you get the first single cell li life form. Then you get, uh, you know, the evolution of your multicellular life forms. And then here's where farm comes in. Then you get fish, amphibians, reptiles, mammals. We'd be considered mammals, right? You'd have early mammals and then ape-like ancestors, which are mammals, and then humans. So that's their story. A frog being an amphibian, they essentially believe... Uh, actually, some like PZ Myers, Richard Dawkins, these guys, they would say we still are fish. <laughs> we are fish, uh, apparently. You know, look, grandpa. You know, so I like to say uh, evolution is hope, dream, and imagine. I, so I, I wanted I to get being around the water. So maybe he might be right for me. I don't know. <laughs> oh, that's great. So getting that out of the way, we don't, as creationists, we don't reject science we don't reject change we see change change is needed f for biblical creation right if ever-changing environments we don't just have one environment right kelly we have many different kinds of environments so ever-changing environments actually require ever-changing genomes ever-changing creatures that have the designed ability to change Mm -hmm. that's that's essentially natural selection the easiest way to understand it kelly is if we took every single dog in the world today and we threw them into let's say alaska over time over time natural selection which just means differential reproduction survival of the fittest who's who's producing the most kids mm -hmm. over time all of your you know thin haired sk skinny dogs you know they they die off um your chihuahuas, they die. I mean, if, if the chihuahuas were, were thrown back into the wild, they the squirrels would eat them. That's right. <laughs> they, they wouldn't stand a chance. So um, all you'd be left with after a few generations is your husky type. That's right. Dog, your wolf That's type. That's natural selection. That's right. That's not evolution. It's not creating anything new. It's manifesting that which was already available. Right. Now, if you take every single dog and throw them into the uh, deserts of Australia, over time, you're going to be left with what? Something like a, a dingo. And your husky type isn't going to survive in, in that type of environment. That's all. That's not evolution. It's adaptation. Right. So on this slide here from the Bible, our starting point, and this is the problem that theistic evolutionists have, is that there's, there's no inclination. And I'd love to get your input on this too, Kelly. 
mm. right from the scriptures. Mm -hmm. There's no inclination that humans have originated from, firstly, pre-human ancestors, or that humans are related to any other form of life, right? The, the Bible tells us, as you can see here, but from the beginning of the creation, what does Genesis 1 say? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's right. But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. So we have Adam and Eve. Okay. And we, we interpret scripture with scripture. Mm -hmm. Genesis 3.20. And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the what? The mother of all living. The mother right. of, that means we all descend from Eve. That's right. She's our our mother, our first She's mother. Very old grandma. That's right. Very old grandma. And 1 Corinthians 15, beautiful verse, 45 to 47. And so is written the what? The second, the 10th, the 20th man? No, the first. first man. First. The first man. First. He's not related to a chimpanzee. He didn't come from an amoeba. He didn't come from a single cell like ancestor. No, the first man. And then Eve, the mother of all living, was made a living soul. And the last Adam being... Jesus Christ. That's if right. there was no first Adam, then why did Jesus come, die on the cross, and save us from our sins? If there's yeah. no first Adam, we don't need the last Adam. Okay? So again, male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam and in the day they were created. So, you know, the, the theistic evolutionists, they want to reinterpret this. They want to say it's, William Lane Craig, Craig calls it mythos history. Okay. Myth, essentially, you know, there, there's stuff we can learn from this. Maybe even part of it's true, but overall it's just, it, it's a beautiful story that reflects the history of the universe, but not literally. This isn't a literal historical account. Well, here's the last thing I want to say, and I'd love to get your thoughts, Kelly, especially on the mm -hmm. scriptures mm -hmm. is Jesus Christ himself is the one that said, but from the beginning of creation, he made them male and female. So Jesus himself is saying that at the beginning of creation, Adam and Eve were the first human beings created separate. People will hear me talk about separate ancestry. This is what it means. Humans were created separate from any other form of life, separate from the chimpanzee. William Lane Craig wants to say that humans and chimpanzees are related. That's contradictory to the scriptures themselves. And here's what I wanted to point out is we don't have to reinterpret this, Kelly. We actually have verification of the first couple, okay, found in scripture in genetics. We've literally discovered in genetics, Adam and Eve. There's two pieces of amazing DNA. One DNA compartment is called mitochondrial DNA. That we get from our mother's side. And it turns out we can actually trace mitochondrial DNA worldwide to one female ancestor in the not so distant past, Eve. Wow. We have another DNA compartment called the Y chromosome. We get that from our fathers. So I got my Y chromosome from my father. He got it from his father. Mm -hmm. We can actually take Y chromosomal DNA worldwide, build a family tree, and you know what it traces back to? One single male ancestor from whom we've all descended from just 4,500 years ago, which would be who? Noah, off of the ark. Why chromosome Noah is what they call him. So mm. to the theistic evolutionists, I say this. This is what the Bible plainly says. This is what the Bible plainly teaches. And we have confirmation of this in science. The science and the scripture both corroborate each other beautifully. Uh, go ahead, brother. You know, what's interesting is like what you brought up there. I'll put that back in a second is when you look at scripture so so we've already been kind of already talking about before believers in christ we were kind of already talking about some of the basics of some of the flaws with uh, you know biogenesis and the mutation process and the survival of the fittest these things are literally just impossibilities like it's just it's, it's almost like the odds i've heard sometimes saying that you know if a tornado swung and went through a junkyard that it would assemble a 747 Boeing plane. The odds of Big Bang and a biogenesis being happening is uh, less than a plane. You know what I mean? Like it, it, it's like a plane has a better chance to go through or a, a train has a better chance to go through a junkyard 
to assemble with all of this flying around stuff, a 747 Boeing plane. That's the odds, right? It's horrible. So, but with, with us, those of us who believe in God, though, like so old earth, young earth people, different people, you pointed out some good scriptures. Obviously, we, I was so happy to point out with Jesus because Jesus points us back to the source of creation. God created both male and female. It goes back to Genesis 1. It goes back to Genesis 3, talking or Genesis 2, that God made a, a helper and her name was Eve, right? We see the fall in Genesis 3, but we also see it, we see it again in Genesis 5, again, how going through that lineage, this historical significance, the lineage, the genealogy. What's interesting to me is you go to the New Testament, you've got Jesus affirming the, the creation story of humanity. You've got the Apostle Paul on a countless places talking about Adam being the first man, as you pointed out, 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, Jesus being the last Adam, right? You've got Paul making mention of historical people like Adam being real people in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, where he's talking about he was fearful for them that they were being deceived like how Adam and Eve were by the serpent. They were being beguiled. Uh, you see uh, Paul again emphasizing the importance of a relationship in the marriage in First Timothy chapter or yeah, First Timothy chapter two about the roles of the spouses. He talks about Adam and Eve right there. So there's just so much scriptural support that Adam and Eve were historical people, but yet theistic evolution wants to somehow take that out of history, somehow symbolize these things, make it doesn't it does it just doesn't fit the narrative, and you have to really kind of really reconstruct. Uh, everything from Genesis 1 through 11, and a lot has happened lately, me being familiar with this part, the emergent church, liberalism, the Jesus the Jesus seminar movement, these guys that have come in in the church is like a spiritual cancer, if you will, and basically they look at Scripture and say, well, this is right, this shouldn't be there, that didn't happen, that's spiritual, and they, they basically butcher the Bible, and it's really sad. And what's interesting, too, is I was just looking at Luke chapter 3, with the genealogy of Jesus over there. And if you look at it, it goes all the way back to who? Adam. So if you put all these pieces together, we're talking about people who believe in the Bible and creation now, these kind of people, but these people who don't want to believe that really there was a historical people named Adam and Eve, the early people, these lineage of genealogies, you pretty much have to literally just rewrite or re- Make up what you want these other scriptures to say. And really, it's no different than what the cults do. And I'm not trying to offend any older people. It's no different than what the Gnostics did back in the day. I know I'm getting now, I'm getting a little theological here. I'm sorry. This, this is the heresy hunter now speaking. I'm sorry. But when you start getting biblical, this is where I have a solid ground on, is that you really are just now playing God with the word of God. What do you think about that? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. They're taking what I think has been demonstrated just a little bit today. They're uh, taking a scientific theory that's not even a theory. It's not even a good hypothesis. What comes way before a theory is called a hypothesis. It's not even a good hypothesis. It's been tested. It's been falsified. So they take this, what I like to call science fiction religion, and they um, force it into the Bible perfectly good Bible. We talked about earlier, holy men speakers are moved by the Holy Ghost, the word of God. And for whatever reason, they want to compromise the word of God by taking bad science and putting it into a, a good book. And I'd like to make this one point based on what you're saying is, and you mentioned him earlier, Dr. Jonathan Sarfati. Yeah. Highly recommend him. Highly recommend his book called Refuting Compromise. Mm. Um, I've got that behind me too. And he does an amazing job, very comprehensive job, irrefutable in my opinion, refuting all of the arguments used by, um, theistic evolutionists, old earth creationists. And, um, I had him on my channel twice. Really? The second one. You've pardon? got all the big boys on your channel, man. <laughs> We've had some fun over the last, uh, three, including yourself, brother. Oh. You're a top dog. I um, nobody compare to these guys. But that's awesome. You've been a blessing. So I'd highly recommend people check. You can check it out on the website. If you go to the video section, I've got a, a huge list of categories 
And um, you can find all these different interviews, clips. I think overall we've got about 1,400. I mean, 1,400 videos you can look through. That's so, so um, awesome. Praise God. Dr. Jonathan Sarfati had him on for two hours, the second show, and we uh, we went over all of uh, their best so-called arguments. And he likes to point out this argument to support the fact that Genesis is written as historical narrative. And um, he points out that one of the indications of this, Kelly, is, is the frequent use of what's called the Vav consecutive. Mm. Okay. What that means is uh, for the audience, when we read, okay, when we read in the Bible, you know, this happened and this happened and that happened and this happened. Okay. We see in Genesis one, I think it's after verse two, we see that it's this Vav consecutive. Mm -hmm. And, and Dr. Sarfati points out that followed by a verb in the Hebrew word order that indicates, indicates what a sequence of events. Mm -hmm. That means we have to take Genesis and we have to read it as a historical narrative. Right on. As in these events actually took place. Yeah. These are not symbolic. This is not myth. And you pointed out, uh, Kelly, which was a fantastic point, and I'm glad you did, that the genealogies take us right back to who? Adam. To Adam. And from Adam to Jesus. Yeah. Adam being the first Adam, Jesus being the last Adam. So the point is, this is real history. And we need a first Adam to justify the last Adam, That's which right. is Jesus Christ. You know, it's also one additional point, because I want, I, want I want to throw out a little controversy, right? Yeah. Is, you know, we looked at scriptures talking about Adam being the first man and God creating, you know, male and female. And you look at the scriptures we're talking about. It's clearly you can clearly see Adam is being called the first man. But now I'm going to go out on a limb. We haven't talked about this yet, but I've got confidence in you, Donnie. There is another view out there called the gap theory. When they go into Genesis 1, 2, and they try to come up with this weird bizarre i don't even know there's just no good word to say it's just this this makes evolution look more factual to me um that this theory that there was this previous mankind that lived but when verse two hit god destroyed it all and then restarted it again and they allude to a couple places like in ezekiel and isaiah to try to back right. it up have you heard this before? I'm assuming you have. Absolutely. I have two. Thank two God videos. you did. I'm so happy. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard it all. When it comes to this, I've heard all the Give us the goods on it, brother. Well, firstly, I'd like to recommend, I always like to recommend a video or an article or something where people can get a really detailed takedown. So I've got two videos I'd recommend. One, again, from Dr. Jonathan Sarfati. Of course, we touched on the gap. He destroyed it in a way more technical way than I could. He's a genius on that he's topic. Great. He's great. And also um, another, he's a geologist. His name's John Mackay, the creation guy. So he's up in <laughs> Australia. <laughs> I finally mastered that. He's well known. He's actually uh, well known for debating Richard Dawkins. Mm. Destroyed Richard Dawkins. So I've got a whole video. He's done a lot of work debunking the gap theory. Nice. So those are two videos I recommend on the gap theory. So if we just look at it, I pulled it up here yeah, in the beginning, God created, created God created the heaven and the earth. Yeah. And the you earth. Share your screen? Do you want to share your screen? Go ahead. Sure. Yeah. Here, let's see. Well, you know, what? I just got it pulled. I don't have a slide for, it. I just pulled it up on Bible gateway. Just oh, okay. 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 So, um, I learned this from you just pull up the scripture and refute it. Right. <laughs> um, Actually, first thing I'd like to say, since the science is my specialty, I've debated these gap theorists before, and a lot of them believe in a local flood, too. Mm. It almost goes hand in hand. Okay, right. You have this like right. pre-earth where you have Satan, you know, roaming free and God had to destroy that and then recreate the earth. And then that's right. what was very good. Right. But then they'll say that eventually, you know, a couple thousand years later, you have a local flood. The gap theory and the local flood idea, both refuted by modern scientific data. Because I was talking about earlier, um, Kelly, the mitochondrial DNA and the Y chromosome, how they only go back to two people. Mm -hmm. That can't be the case if there was a local flood. Because that means you'd have people outside of the local area that would have survived. That's right. It shouldn't go back to just two people. That's and right. that also goes for the gap theory. If we had human beings 
before the creation of the earth, right? An earth that was destroyed and another earth yep. with people before then, then that should reflect in our DNA. And it actually doesn't. And DNA is very basic, Kelly. It's what I like to call in my books, the direct line of evidence. We mm. have DNA. You can do ancestry tests. You can figure out where you came from. And that's where we can discover uh, Adam and Eve. Direct lines of evidence alone already refute the gap. But if we just go to the script, we just go. So it's not even consistent. So why compromise if the science that they want to so-called uphold refutes their compromise? It, it just baffles my mind. So Genesis 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and the earth. So this is where they want to say is the gap. Right. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It was formless this, this, and void. this is a thought that's con that's continued. Yeah. And the earth, so now the earth, we're focusing in on the earth, was without form. So this is how the earth was before God created the land and grass and living things. That's all it's saying. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light and so on and so forth. And then eventually you get down to... Um, verse nine and 10, verse 10, and God called the dry land earth, right? When he brings uh, together the waters, let the water, waters under the heaven be gathered together under one place and let the dry land appear. So all this is showing is how the earth was before God created the land, the creatures. It was without form and void. It's not saying that we had a heaven and an earth and then that earth was destroyed. And then now we have another earth. You know, I, I have it on the screen now, too, for people to see. And, you know, it's, I always find this fascinating because, yeah, like you said, in the beginning, God created heaven and the earth. So it's kind of a declaration. So this is like the very start, the origin source, if you will. And when he was beginning, of course, the earth was formless and void, dark from the surface of the deep. And we see also here the spirit of God, the third person of the Trinity, praise God. He was moving or brooding over the surface of the water, therefore bringing it into its formation, right? And so we see then this list of, like you've been saying, there's order. There's order to now what's going on. So all that verse 2 is saying is now when things are beginning, this is how it was. And then God started bringing things into its order and its creation. So when people try to do the, the, the mumbo jumbo, if you will, trying to say that there was this previous creation, the people, and, and, they, and they obviously sucked and God destroyed them and then started again. Well, that, that narrative is nowhere found in the Old Testament, and by golly, nowhere even close to the New Testament. We see Jesus refuted. We see Paul refuted. We see the genealogy refuted. I mean, just looking at the Bible itself, as I always like to do, you know me, let the Bible speak for where it's clear, and I think you, get, you did a great job there. Amen. Amen. Appreciate it, brother. Appreciate it. All one right. Thing I'll add, one thing I'll add to that, and it's what you said. I just want to reiterate the, the importance of the fact, and I love that you said this, um, Kelly, the apostles and Jesus himself took the Genesis account as literal history, That's a right. literal historical narrative. Right. Jesus, Jesus says from the did, beginning the of the did, the early church did. Right. I mean, yeah. Who do we believe, man or God? Do we put our faith in the wisdom of man? Yep. Yeah. Or in the power of God. That's I'm right. choosing to put my faith in the power of God. Not the wisdom of man. Because you know what? The wisdom of man is foolishness to God. And Amen. the science of the day, quote unquote, is constantly changing. Constantly changing. Look, Amen. A textbook 30 years ago versus now. Do you know how many things have been overturned? Where scientists would look at those technical papers from 30 years ago and scoff at it. It's always changing. But the word of God does not change. And, and that's where we need to place our faith. So, you know, and what's amazing to me is when you look at God's creation, like, you know, Psalm 19 talks about the heavens declare the majesty of God. You look at Romans 1. Romans 1 talks about that God has made his evidence, the truth evident within, our, within us. And you look at the creation, you look at all things around us, we can see. Just like you look at a phone, nobody in your right noggin out there would think over billions of years, this awesome phone, somehow with all these cool colors and 
this cool thing that you know straps in keeps my thing from being protected and all these little gadgets and everything else all of a sudden just happen to work perfectly or you know even like this this wonderful you know clear dr pepper that i always like to drink them when i'm on my channel right it's just straight up shot clear dr pepper right it's good stuff right nobody's gonna think this cup came into existence by itself i mean you look at all your books around you and things everything has purpose and design like you said earlier with our dna it's so evident that there's intent and design in the code and you look at creation and yet people still want to reject the obvious if you will and i want to i want to spring this this guy mark thank you mark by the way lord bless you um he says a good discussion let's pray for anyone in chat who is not saved and let's give them the gospel and love and pray the spirit will work in life praise lord mark you're absolutely correct because that's one of the reasons why i do what i do what what donnie does what he does is because it, the whole point of what we do is we're serving the lord and we want people to come to know jesus christ and this is again historical stuff right significance you look at creation you look at history you look at who Jesus Christ is. I mean, you look at what Jesus, he came and gave his life for us. He pointed us to the, the creator God. He died upon the cross, rose again, and he, he self-sacrificed himself so that people could know there's true purpose, true meaning life, that we're not here to spontaneously. We didn't come from goo to you. Um, there's there's actually hope in this world. There's, there's more to look forward to. And yet, this is why we do what we do. What? What would you like to add? What is some of your motivation to reach atheists? Because remember, you used to be an atheist. Well, that's a great question. One thing I'll say to kind of add what you're saying is, um, why can we do science in the first place? Okay, we have all this evidence for design that you're reiterating here, right? We've talked about irreducible complexity. We, we've top, talked about the importance of taking Genesis for what it is. It claims to be the history book of the universe. We can actually test that. Not that not that the Bible or God needs testing, but we can hypothetically and we have, we can test its claims to modern scientific data. And modern scientific data has confirmed the first couple Adam and Eve. It's confirmed the global flood. We can actually find evidence for the global flood and not only geology, but also in genetics. The direct line line of evidence. It's, it's discovered the Tower of Babel and the dispersal. Okay, so the account of our origins in Genesis has been verified through scientific data. But a question that I like to, to ask is, why can we actually do science in the first place, Kelly? The only reason we can do science is because, as you've recently pointed out, design and the fact that the universe is actually so orderly. We can do science because the universe is orderly. We have laws, which we know implies a lawgiver, like we explained earlier. Programming in the DNA requires a programmer, right? And so the universe appearing to be the result of, of a rational mind, we can confidently go to bed, wake up, and know that, that the sun is going to be up. Right, we, we can be confident of that because we have a worldview, the worldview of Christianity. We have a strong foundation. Where oftentimes the evolutionists, unfortunately, the, the naturalists, they actually have to borrow the, the Christian worldview in order to just rationally do science in, in the first place. So why am I so passionate about this is, for one, I'm passionate about the Bible. I'm passionate about science. Science and the Bible go perfectly together. And the light bulb that went off, brother, when I was enlightened and I came to the knowledge of the truth, the joys that I felt, I want others to feel that joy. If you're a Christian, if you're already saved, if you're already born again, I want to remove any doubts that you have. If you have questions or there's been challenges that you've been confronted with from atheists and evolutionists, I want to give you answers to those challenges so you can be confident in your faith, confident in your faith. If you're not yet saved, well, I want to remove the blinders. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It's the word of God that saves, the power of God unto, uh, unto salvation, right? But 
to remove those blinders, oftentimes the evidence from science, design, fine tuning, the evidence uh, f- for creation that, that we can talk about here, like we have mitochondrial Eve, Y chromosome, Noah, so on and so forth. Those can remove the blinders of those seeking the gospel like it did for me. So I want to bring those that are not saved to salvation. And I want to uh, bring confidence to the faith of those that are already saved. And that, that's why I do what I do. He that winneth souls is wise, right? It's all about winning souls. It's all about bringing people to God. So. Amen. Amen. Uh, yes. I just now saw your private there. Yes. We can do that. We have about 10 minutes here. Uh, one addition on the Slim 2K here asked a question. Let's just follow up quickly on the, the gap theory for a second here. Um, can you mention this? I've seen it. I've seen it should be translated from the Hebrew as the earth became without form and void for the gap theory. Then Jeremiah 4.23 supports it. Now, I've looked in this before. I'll just give a quick answer. And I know there's some great resources online. I'm actually looking at one right now with answers in Genesis. And this is what they state here. It says, the passage has been used by supporters of the gap theory to support their position. Jeremiah 40, 423 describes the earth as being without form and void. And the gap theory asks, when was this ever the case? And the answer is in Genesis 1, 2. Therefore, the gap theorists conclude that this must refer to some catechism that overcame the world after Genesis 1, 1. However, Context is the key to understanding. Yes, is always what I say. Jeremiah 4 describes the impending destruction of Judah. So if you read Jeremiah 4, which I was just looking at, this gives context to what's being stated here. Uh, destruction of Judah because of Judah's disbelief. In verse 23, Jeremiah uses the language of Genesis 1-2 to indicate how complete that destruction will be. The Hebrew word translated earth here is aratz. The same word is translated as land in verses 5, 7, and 28, and 27, which I have looked at in the past. The Hebrew readers of Jeremiah 4, the context is very clear. They knew that the language here referred to Judah, not some original creation. And that's an important point that I would like to emphasize as well. This is not talking about origin of source or creation. It's talking about the judgment that was structured that was going to be coming. However... In keeping with the borrowing of the language of Genesis 1-2 in Jeremiah 4.23, most English translations have retained earth in verse 23 rather than land. So it could be translated land is what's being basically stated, which I would agree. This is unfortunate that it leads to confusion. And this is a lot of times what people will do is it'll lead to this theory of there was this previous creation, previous mankind that got destroyed with obscure verses like this that just don't make any sense. So therefore goes on talking about some other stuff. So what I would say in response here is, you know, be careful. Oh, I thought I had that up there for people to see. I'm so sorry. (laughs) I thought I had the scripture up there. But the point is, is that when you're looking at Jeremiah 4, there's a whole thing, as I always like to say, context, context, context. So the reader would have understood this was had to do with the Israel, Judah's judgment. It wasn't pointing to anything about the origin source. What would you like to add to that? If you'd like to add anything to that. Very good. Um, Your response was great. I just posted in the, um, in the live chat, the video that actually addresses that argument uh, from Dr. Jonathan Sarfati. Give it to me in private because I don't have links allowed. Oh, you're right. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. Just because there's some weirdos out there. So yeah. (laughs) <laughs> it's it's called another knockout punch to the gap theory or the gap joke is is what i put it but um here's the link guys that he has asked if you want to share there you go but uh, dr jonathan sarfati you know he'll point out that this whole idea of translating genesis 1 2 as these gap theorists do to um it, it became uh void is that what they want to translate it to? It became or had become without form and void. Yeah. Um, not only Dr. Sarfati, but others who have studied this um, in great detail have called that a, an exegetical fallacy. 
And um, they just point out from the grammar, from the Hebrew, that that's, again, just a classic case of eisegesis. They believe in the gap theory, and they're taking whatever flimsy evidence they can find to support it. It doesn't fit the... Again, I think he points to the Vav consecutive in the fact that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and it's, it's continuing the thought. Mm -hmm. It's continuing the narrative and the earth was without form and void. So if you want a really technical and what I believe irrefutable answer, just, just watch that video. He's, awesome. he's done a ton of work on, here's the book that I recommend actually refuting compromise. Yes. And yeah. you can see it's a thick one. I mean, yeah. he, <laughs> he, he covers these arguments in, in great detail. So, awesome. and I'd also just put the link after that video. Uh, so here, if you see in the guys that, that's in the, uh, the, the comment section that's from um, what Donnie just put out there. And then I just gave the link from what I was just also referencing a moment ago. So there are, there's a lot of sources out there to when you dig into it, look into it as always, the, the, it's, it's kind of like, you know, when you're looking at any kind of topic in the Bible, there's going to be some verses here, some verses there that may have the appearance. It's always so important to look at the context, look at what words mean. Don't always go off of what you read. Sometimes of your English, translation though i i'm not saying that they're not always going to you know uh they're going to be good but sometimes you have to be careful of that because sometimes some words could have been trying a little bit better right so i hope that was good cool um so we have officially five minutes left now because we've got to go rapid fast now right so but i think this is great donnie i think you've done great for your first time out of this you know right out of right out of the shot ran right out of the rocket you've been shot out of the cannon man you're you're on fire <laughs> I want to bring you back on my channel. Like I know you can bring me back on your channel um, and we can do some more stuff. We didn't really get to, and we didn't really even ask question and answer. Maybe we could do that another time, but uh, it was just great having you here. What, what can we wrap up with this concluding thing that you would like to share for the audience? Amen. I appreciate that brother. I'd love to, I've, I've got endless material for you. So I'm happy to, um, come on anytime. One question that I saw in the live chat was from Mark Kerr that I thought was interesting that I don't mind <clears throat> taking a couple extra minutes just to address. I think it, Oh, here it is. It's up at the top. He says something about the, the second law of thermodynamics and yes. decay in the universe. So that is a great question and something I would like to get on your program. So, you know what? I think it's worth it. If, if I could, I'm not sure if you can see it. I'm, get, I'm, 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 I'm getting to find it here in a second. In no, no rush. He says, this might be off topic, but the second law of thermodynamics says everything is in decay. As, as you're finding that, take your time. I'll just add something before, and then I'm going to share my screen, and I'll show you some interesting stuff. Um, but you have the, the, the first law of thermodynamics, the second law of thermodynamics, okay? Which is amazing evidence for God and a creation, and I'll explain why. The first law essentially states that ma matter and energy can neither be created nor destroyed. But the second law is essentially what is called the law of increasing entropy. Everything's winding down. Everything is decaying. Well, what this means in light of the first law, if matter and energy can neither be created nor destroyed, think about this logically, but everything's winding down. That means you wind things back up to a starting point. That means there has to be an outside force that brought forth matter and energy. Time, matter, and space all had to come into existence at the same time. And the atheists have this problem that's akin, there we go, that is akin to if I were to ask, explain to me how this computer, this laptop I'm on right now, how is this created, but you can't use man. Okay. Well, no, you, you have to use man because it's man that engineered and designed the computer. The naturalist wants to, to pretty much ask the question, how is the universe designed and created, but you can't use God. That's fallacious. It doesn't, it, it doesn't work because an outside agent, okay, is what was required to bring forth the universe in the first place. He mentions the second law. Yes, things are winding down. You can wind things back to a beginning, but that beginning point we know matter and energy can neither be created nor destroyed. That is the, the first law. So how did matter and energy be created? Well, from an outside source. Second law disproves what's called the, um, 
not the steady state theory of the universe, the Big Bang, but those that will say that the universe goes on forever. It's mm -hmm. just, it, it, it never really had a beginning. No, the, the second law actually tells us it did have a beginning. But what I like to um, point out is decay in what we know of as uh, in the genome. So if you could share my screen real quick and I'll go over just I a couple minutes. I'm more than happy to. Here we go. <laughs> Appreciate it, brother. So this right here, in my opinion, is the best evidence for creation. This is what I call a double whammy, Kelly. It's evidence for creation, evidence against evolution. Awesome. And um, a book I recommend, you asked earlier what I'd recommend, is a book by a, uh, a geneticist named Dr. John Sanford. He's actually, he invented the gene gun. He's recently, I have it on my channel. He recently spoke at the NIH, the National Institute for Health, on what's mm -hmm. called genetic degeneration. Okay. And what that means is on this slide here, it is the genetic degeneration of living things. What that means is as time goes on, we are getting worse. We're going downhill. We're not going uphill as right. technically evolution would. Yeah, require. we're supposed to be going the other way, right? We're supposed to be going the other way, more or less. <laughs> and this applies beautifully. So this applies in a way to the second law because the universe is winding down. The universe is decaying. But you know what? the genome is also decaying. So if we take this point of most accumulating genetic load, okay, we have a genetic load higher than it's ever been. Take this point to, uh, take this back to a point of least increasing entropy, it's called least genetic load. That would be a point of perfection, a point of creation, a point where God created the first two people, Adam and Eve, free from mutations, free from decay. And when we plot this, brother, so on, on the, um, the slide here, you can see the biblical lifespans. Okay, and you can see how high they were in the pre-flood world, Adam, Seth, Enoch, Adam close to a thousand. Um, Noah up here close to a thousand as well, but you notice right after the flood and closer to now, closer to the time of Jesus. And then obviously now as the environment changes for the worse mutations accumulate, we add to this growing genetic load lifespans decrease exponentially. Mm -hmm. This is what's called an exponential decay curve. Hmm. Okay. And um, I have this graphed out, a gentleman here named Dr. Dan Biddle, he runs a ministry called Genesis Apologetics. I had him on my channel. People can check it out for a detailed presentation on this. And he essentially points out that if this was just coincidence, the fact that what we know about science and mutation accumulation and the um, exponential decay in the Bible, when you plot these biblical lifespans of the biblical patriarchs, it's impossible for this to be a coincidence because for, for it to be a coincidence, if it was fabricated as the theistic evolutionists would technically have to say, then our early biblical patriarchs would have had to have had advanced knowledge in mathematics and biology ju just to fake this, just to make it uh, graph out the, the way it does. Hmm. So the point I'm trying to make is mutations are accumulating, man is degenerating, we're getting worse, not better. And so the driving force of evolution to take your single celled like ancestor into a whale to say that whales and strawberries to bring it home. There you right? go. You brought it back. You brought it back. Yes. <laughs> bring it right back, baby. Bring, bring it right, it right back. back to the, the strawberries came from whales. Praise the Lord. So to say that strawberries and whales are related to a common ancestor means that mutations have to make things better. Mutations actually make things worse. They break down pre-existing systems. We accumulate many mutations every single generation. It's why we have decreased in, in terms of our longevity, in terms of our age. So the second law of thermodynamics, it, it applies and it brings us back to the fall, brother. It brings us back to the fall of Adam and Eve and the fact that we are in decay and disease and sickness. You know what? It, it's a sad reality. It's a result of the fall. We see this in the second law. But you know what? Our hope, Kelly, our hope is not in this world. 
right. our hope is in Christ. And that's why the gospel is, is so important, brother. So I'll wrap it up there. You know, I want to bring this on the screen here. Thank you. Appreciate that. You know, when you look at um, Genesis 1 and we see how Genesis 1 gives us the creation account of all different things. Certain days it was good. Next day it was good. Then makes man and woman. And we see how that takes place in Genesis 2. There's order and design. There's order and design. And we see how the scriptures teach us. Now, just going off scriptures, that God created all things on six days and then rested on the seventh. Now, what's interesting is kind of going back a little bit to the old earth kind of perspective, even getting outside of the evidence of the science realm, per se, outside of the Bible. There's so much inward, internal evidence from the word of God that, per, that teaches that um, it, it wouldn't have been this long period of time. Just going back to Adam. How, how that would fit with Adam and where did Adam come from and where did woman, you know, did woman, because the Bible says woman came from man, right? You know, like took a rib from, Ad, from Adam and made a woman. How, how does that work with old earth perspective? Obviously it doesn't, right? Because they don't exist. But what's interesting is if you look at scripture, because remember Moses wrote Genesis, right? We know that. Well, Moses, who gave us the first five books of the Bible, which is called the Tanakh. Uh, well, actually, sorry, the Torah, the Tanakh of the Old Testament, all the 39 scriptures or 39 books. But the first five books is what's called the Torah or the Pentateuch. And we see in Exodus here, the Ten Commandments, right? Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol for any likeness of what's in heaven above or on earth below or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them nor serve them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. Key thing, hate me. But showing loving kindness to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not leave him unpunished for who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor. Six days you shall labor. This is what was instructed for the Israelites, the Jewish people back in those days who were back in these times. Six days you shall worship and do all your work. But the seventh day, which is a Saturday, is a Sabbath the Sabbath of the Lord your God. And in it, you shall not do any work. You or your son, your daughter, your male or female servant, your cattle or your cattle can't even do work. I mean, the cattle are excited for having a day off. Praise God, right? They're happy. And your sojourner who stays with you. But now look at this. The same dude, the same dude, Moses, who wrote Genesis, who wrote these other places, the same dude, Bam, booms, Zambonizes it here. You're getting sermonated right now. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth. Remember a little while ago? Six days you shall strive, you shall labor and do your work. Six literal days, and then you have a Sabbath day off. That's called a week. Six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and all the seed that's in them, the rest of the seventh day. Folks, there's science, there's evidence, and the Bible teaches clearly and unequivocally what we would define as young earth perspective, what the scriptures teach. Would you like to add anything to that, Donnie? Amen, brother. Well said. No, I think you said it perfectly. Uh, this has been a privilege, uh, Kelly. Two hours flies by. It always does with you. Uh, you've been a blessing, and I would... Uh, be honored to join you again, uh, certainly in the future. This is an important topic, brother, and I want the audience to know that you can be confident in the Word of God. There's nothing to be scared about. A lot of times, you know, these evolutionists, these big name atheists, they might come across as intimidating. Oftentimes, they're bullies. But just remember, there are answers. There are sufficient answers to even their best of challenges. Again, that's why I, I wrote this book. You know, the endogenous retrovirus handbook, even their best lines of evidence, the ones that they just 
you know, you'll oftentimes hear their testimonies. I used to be a creationist. And then I saw this and this and this, you know what? This is the last thing I want to say. Their best lines of evidence that we've addressed thoroughly on, on our channel and ministry actually turn out to be some of the best evidence for young earth creation. And and Mm. that's the truth. Amen. Amen. We go one more. It looks like I got, thank you. Whoever you are, George Bond, praise Lord. Thank you. <laughs> Listen to Donnie. He's a messenger from the Lord. Amen. And he likes pizza just like me. Well, who can argue with that? Amen. Amen. I can. I can. Amen. Well, Actually, I'll say this, Kelly. That's George Bond. I was telling you about him earlier. Our team on our about team. So oh, George okay. is the man. He's he's the retired engineer. Him oh. and yeah, him and Professor David McQueen, they are doing all the geology research on on Noah's flood for awesome. the team. And then Matt, who's who's my partner, we do a lot of the biology and genetics research. So it it's a blessing to have a team because it's it's hard to be an expert at everything. So George, you know what? I'm after a show like this, I'm craving a pizza. We call it marinara down under. I love it. I love it. Hey, I think our next video will be uh, do do pineapples come from pizza? <laughs> Love it. <laughs> do pineapple? Um, does pizza taste good with pineapples on it? Oh, uh, that's a I big debate. Yeah. That, that's you know, uh, I'm gonna leave my answer alone for right now. Well, we'll give me a minute for your time after, and then we'll we'll let you go off to your wife. But I'm gonna wrap up here. And thank you so much for being on here, Donnie. It's a pleasure having you on, okay? My pleasure, brother. God bless you. Everybody out there, you definitely got to go check. Obviously, if you've been here, you know it. The link is in his channel or my uh, description here. So go check it out. Many of you already probably know him. Such a blessing having him on here, having him share his testimony. A wealth of information for such a young man in the Lord. It's great. And so it's an honor and privilege for me have him on my channel and i hope that you guys were all blessed out here what a joy it was and so i hope you guys come back uh share this video you know leave some questions here and there donnie i'm sure he's a busy guy like me but maybe i'll check some things out or just contact him if you have any further further questions or things like that as well and so lord bless you always get into the word of god be a berean check the evidence for science check the evidence for creation let me tell you something You did not come from goo. The Lord made you and he loves you and he wants you to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Lord bless.